Hey BC, what's up? Uh, took the week off, not um, entirely because I wanted to. I was, you know, we were, we were moving into a new apartment as I did a quick update video for. We're about probably like 90% moved in. Honestly, it's all my stuff I'm trying to figure out with um, moving shelves around. And uh, I think I'm gonna probably buy a new um, uh, stereo shelf to, uh, you know, one of the ones that like you put all the components vertically with the turntable on top. But um, yeah, anyway, uh, what got cut off there was my continuation of my top 100 um, record series. And um, this is part, I don't even know what part this is, it's part nine. So this is uh, number 20 through 11. I'll go ahead and get started, I guess. Uh, number 20 is, it might be the newest album. No, that's not true. Um, it's the second newest album on my whole list is uh, Sufjan Stevens record, uh, Carrie and Lowell. If you don't know Sufjan Stevens, he was kind of a um, uh, typical singer-songwriter. He's great at writing songs. He's a great kind of beautiful uh, voice and he's a decent guitar player. Um, he really shines in his, his lyrics and songwriting in general though. But um, this record is insanely personal for him. Um, he always kind of uh, maybe hid behind um, uh, metaphors and allegory. Um, and there's a little bit of that on this record, but it's for the most part pretty straightforward. Um, it's talking about his feelings for his mother, Carrie, who um, you'll listen to the record and you'll, you'll quickly realize that she kind of abandoned uh, her family while they were very young and uh, came back in their lives later, but then she died um, while he was, or she was the, her death is the inspiration for writing this record. But anyway, um, uh, what was I gonna say about this? Oh, it, this is considered kind of part three. He has kind of a, a project he was working on that was um, supposedly going to be a thing that ended up not really being a thing. One of the records already was on my list, um, Michigan. He, he was going to do a, a series of 50 albums, one for each state in the U.S., um, and he's done Michigan and Illinois, and this was originally going to be um, Oregon, and a lot, of the, a lot of the songs are kind of centered around Oregon, um, like name-dropping a couple like national parks or bridges or things like that. He loves doing that kind of thing, but it ended up being way more personal um, than, than his uh, 50 States projects. Yeah, fantastic record. A um, little bit of a tearjerker. Uh, another tearjerker in probably a less serious way is uh, number 19, American Football's uh, 1999 self-titled. They just came out with another self-titled record. I want to say that was 2016. Not nearly as good as this, but um, yeah, their debut, can't go wrong. This is just a standard black vinyl pressing. There's also a pretty easy to find um, pressing that's on like red marble vinyl. It has like a second disc of like uh, outtakes and bonus bonus material that I wouldn't mind getting eventually. But yeah, this is a project from uh, probably most famously um, the Kinsella brothers who um, they are Mike and um, I forgot the other one's name. The Those brothers, they were in bands like Cap and Jazz. Um, this, is, this is pretty much the quintessential emo record. It's up there uh, with Sunny Day Real Estate's debut, Diary, um, their second and third records. Um, you know, Mineral, Texas is the Reason. If you're into those kind of bands, you have absolutely already heard this record. If you haven't heard any of those, this is a great place to jump in for the genre. I know emo kind of gets a, maybe a little bit of a bad rep for uh, being like, um, you know, all, all black clothes and eyeliner and stuff, but this is like, it's pretty much just dudes and uh, a bunch of white dudes and uh, with, with a, you know, clean guitar tone. Um, this this kind of generated the, the kind of joke genre term, like twinkly guitar, twinkle. Um, that's that's kind of accurate though, because like I said, clean guitar tones, very little reverb, um, and just kind of shimmering, shimmering kind of guitar parts that 
sort of float and bounce around um, very lightly. It's a very great record guitar-wise. Um, songwriting, again, kind of decent. Lyrically, maybe not so strong. Uh, it definitely evokes um, feelings of like lost high school romance and um, maybe a feeling of uh, moving off to college or something like that. But yeah, fantastic record. One of my favorites, obviously, if it's this high up on the list. And I uh, can't really recommend it enough, so check that out, American Football. So that brings us to 17 here. Or no, it doesn't. Yeah, brings us to, to 18. I can't count. My girlfriend's laughing at me. Um, this is New Order, Power Corruption and Lies. Um, this is original US pressing. It has like a weird die cut thing that corresponded with the uh, Blue Monday 12 inch single, which I have around here somewhere. Um, and this whole decoder thing again corresponded with um, the, the single that came out at the time. I forget where you were supposed to decode. Maybe it's on the inner sleeve of this, but um, you match the colors with a number, or I mean uh, with a letter, and it ends up spelling out New Order, Power, Corruption, Lies. And then on the front, it's like FAC, uh, whatever the catalog number is, Factory Records. Um, that's the thing you hear over there, though, um, musically. In my opinion, is New Order New Order's peak, or uh, part of their peak. I really love the period here between like 1980 through uh, through 82, or about 83. All the singles and B sides were great. This record is fantastic, obviously. Um, I know a lot of you guys aren't really into like synth pop or like 80s in general, um, and there there is a lot of that on here. But uh, it's still a strong album guitar wise and. Uh, can't really say it too enough about uh, Peter Hook's bass playing either. Um, kind of a, he really uh, lives in the world of like a lead bass player, the concept of lead bass, um, the concept of a, a bass guitar driving really the main, uh, main riff of a song or melody even. Um, but yeah, New Order, I think a lot of you know this one. This is my favorite New Order. Um, now we're at 17. This is Dylan's Highway 61 Revisited. This is an original mono pressing. As you can see, the cover is not in the greatest shape, but I was lucky enough to get this um, for 10 bucks at Doc's Records probably a year or two ago. Um, lots of times they'll do that where they'll, they'll have a classic record, not in the cleanest condition, but they'll have a, a great value on it. I pick a lot of those up. Um, not my favorite Dylan. There's still one more ahead of this. Um, I know this is, what is this ranked on the Rolling Stone Top 100? It's like number three? Two or three? Uh, I think it's three. But um, huge hit on here, right, like a Rolling Stone. One of his um, trademark songs, one of his most important songs probably. Um, again, just kind of a flawless record, not one bad moment on here. It's deep into his um, kind of rambling, more, uh, more av not avant-garde, but like less direct songwriting. He's past the protest singer thing. He's, uh, a lot of these songs are personal, but lots of times around this, around this period in his career, he would, he would write songs about specific people and about things and uh, events that he would see. Um, like Ballad of a Thin Man, really, um, I mean, the guy in it's named Mr. Jones, and I really wonder who that song is really about, because it's like so, so sarcastic and kind of bitter in a weird way. Um, but I love Highway 61 Revisited, kind of um, uh, a song kind of chronicling a lot of uh, blues legends, uh, people from like the Mississippi Delta, and uh, Probably my favorite one on here is It Takes a Lot to Laugh, It Takes a Train to Cry. Um, uh, I also gotta throw a quick nod to Desolation Row, the epic 11 minute track that closes the record. Um, lyrically, it's one of his best songs. He's on point vocally. Um, and there's, a, there's like a lead guitar uh, going throughout the song that's also really fantastic. Um, it's not like classic, but it's like a, a lead guitar part on, a, on an acoustic guitar. You all know this one. I don't really need to sell that to you. Um, 16, my favorite uh, Beatles solo record, George Harrison, All Things Must Pass. This gets talked about all the time. I've talked about it a lot. 
Um, I can't really say enough good things about it. In terms of uh, aesthetic for an album, it's probably one of my favorites. Um, if I ever made a record, if I ever um, sat down and recorded something, I would want it to sound like this, honestly. A great mix of, um, not, I wouldn't even call it like classic rock. I don't think I would go too deep into the Phil Spector style of production either. Those moments are probably some of my least favorite on the record, but whenever it's a straightforward um, ballad, um, sorry, there's a train going by now. I live really close to a train station and it's like 50-50 whether or not they're gonna blast the horn super loud. Um, anyway, what was I talking about? Uh, all the ballads on here are fantastic with the straightforward production. Stuff like um, the opener, I Live For You, or not I Live For That was one of the bonus tracks. Um, I'd Have You Anytime, which he co-wrote with Dylan. There's a Rescue Dylan track on here. Um, I don't think it's, I gotta look at the traffic listing, I'm sorry. It's gonna be bad if I don't. It's, um, if not for you, that was a Rescue Dylan song. Um, one of my favorites on here is Behind That Locked Door. I love the slide guitar, the pedal steel um, slide guitar that's all over this record. Gives it a nice country feeling. That's what I'm talking about with the aesthetic. Um, there's lots of acoustic guitars, obviously, being George Harrison. Uh, I, didn't, I haven't even mentioned My Sweet Lord yet. That's the big hit on here. That's the one you've all heard. Um, and even that one has a little bit larger production than most other songs on here. But um, this this period of George was, I don't, I don't think many people would disagree that it was his peak. Because um, his, his uh, level of songwriting skill um, in, the, in the last year and a half, maybe uh, two years of the Beatles, from like 68 through uh, 69, early 70, when these songs were written, um, apparently he wrote hundreds of songs and only only a couple dozen ended up being recorded for this um, and there's a couple others floating around in bootlegs and things but um, this period of his songwriting was was head and shoulders above even like the rest of his songwriting catalog um, for like the early Beatles stuff and through his later solo career that's all that's all I'm trying to say is this is peak George Harrison again not a unique opinion of mine Hardly anyone I think would disagree. Um, so what does that make this? 15? Let me count backwards. Uh, yeah, 15. Again, another one that I don't think really needs any introduction. This is Unknown Pleasures by Joy Division. Um, just the opener, Disorder. One of their best songs, hands down. Um, fantastic bass playing, guitar playing, drumming. He encouraged his vocals are, are arguably one of his best uh, recordings. Um, if you only listen to one Joy Division song ever, I mean, besides like Level Tear Us Apart, if you only listen to one other song besides that, it would probably have to be Dis Disorder that I would recommend to you. Um, and it's not like they have that many songs anyway, so you might as well listen to their entire catalog. Um, Two records and like uh, a couple singles and B-sides and that's it. Um, but yeah, yes, this is an original U.S. pressing, or maybe not original because it's got the smooth cover, but it's like an early pressing. Um, I did, I do love this about the artwork, how um, on the front there's no text, it's just the kind of classic um, uh, design that you all know. On the back it has a little bit of text, but space intentionally left blank where a track listing might go. And then a uh, small catalog number, and that's really it for artwork. The labels are just the same design. Um, I don't remember where the track listing is. It might be on the labels. Um, no, it's not on the labels. It's, it's on like a. It's on the inner sleeve. That's where they are. Um, so yeah, off the top of my head, uh, the tracks on here. Candidates like track three, one of my favorites. Definitely a more of a slow, kind of haunting song. Um, Day of Lords, again, probably one of their, objectively one of their best songs. Um, there's a couple faster tracks towards the later half um, that I'm blanking on the names of, but you know them. They, they have a more straightforward punk feeling or more like their early Warsaw demos and things. Um, 
I think you can't go wrong with any of the tracks on here. Uh, Unknown Pleasures, again, you want to probably know most, if not all, of these. Um, 14 here. Um, I don't think many people would disagree. Pet Sounds is one of the best records of all time. Um, the hype is real, in my opinion. Um, wouldn't it be nice? You still believe in me? That's not me. Don't talk, put your head on my shoulder is um, a really beautiful track. Um, maybe a little bit of a darker texture there, but it's still great. Um, I'm waiting for the day. The instrumental, let's go away for a while. And Sloop John B to close out the first side. I mean, that's just the first side, and that's already, you know, that would already be a perfect record if it was only that, honestly. But then you have side two, which is arguably pro probably the better side with God Only Knows. I know there's an answer here today. I just wasn't made for these times. Uh, another instrumental, Pet Sounds, which I think is the better of the two instrumentals. And uh, Caroline No, which is a terribly uh, sad and beautiful song. But um, yeah. that song's kind of about like the death of um, childhood or innocence in some way. Um, maybe it could be applied to like a relationship aspect, but um, with his wife at the time. Um, Brian Wilson's wife, I mean, you all know uh, what was going on in his head. Um, making this was quite an ordeal and, and he would go on to try to top this with Smile and it probably almost killed him. So um, even he in his own head felt like he had to try to live up to the, to the greatness that he knew this record was. Um, Again, I don't need to sell this to you. Most of you already probably know that. And know the story. It's a, it's a good story. So, uh, 23 is television's debut album, Marquee Moon, 77, I believe this was. Maybe like a recording, 76. Um, I can't read lips, I'm sorry. 23. Uh, I meant 13. Did I say 23? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I do that a lot in these videos. I, I say the wrong numbers. Um, only eight tracks. Um, and again, this is another band. They only have three records, two of, two of which were in their uh, 70s period. Um, one was, I think, like in the 90s. But um, I don't think anyone would disagree. This is probably their best. Um, See No Evil, um, Venus, Friction the epic Marky Moon um, elevation. I'm actually a big fan of the track Guiding Light, the kind of slower uh, ballad. I really love the chord progression in there. Uh, Prove It's Great and Torn Curtain, again, another one with like a, a little bit of a darker texture, but this is just a hugely influential record. I mean, the sound of it um, alone, uh, along with like um, stuff like uh, The Modern Lovers and um, Maybe a little bit like the Buzzcocks, you know, influenced so many, um, so many uh, post-punk revival bands that I've already talked about earlier in this list. Stuff like uh, The Strokes, Interpol, Franz Ferdinand, um, The Killers. Um, they all kind of can trace back their sound to this this record. Not that again they invented um, the kind of uh, just um, straight. You, you can't really call it anything but punk. Um, I mean, not that it's like hardcore or anything, but um, it's like pre New Wave. They were, I consider them probably one of the earliest punk bands. I think they were formed in like what, like '74. That's pretty early. Um, uh, I'm not talking about like proto punk either. I'm talking about like straightforward uh, punk rock. Um, huge in the CBGB scene. Um, and uh, who was on here? Tom Verlaine and uh, Richard Lloyd, who um, did the guitar work on here, um, would appeal, I think, to the to the classic rock fans out there. If you've ever heard this record and you like classic rock music, uh, check this one out because the guitar work will really impress you. I think just check out the track "Marquee Moon," the the title track. You will not be disappointed. Uh, so number twelve. My second favorite Radiohead record, Kid A. 
Um, maybe I just gave away what my favorite Radiohead album is that will appear next week. But um, Kid A is my second favorite. This, uh, this came out in 2000. And this, before I go any further, this is the 12-inch version. There's several 10-inch versions out there. The original came out on 10-inch vinyl. Um, this just recently came out like 2016 or 17. Um, and it doesn't, honestly, it's not a great pressing at all. It's kind of a terrible pressing, but um, most pressings of this record are terrible. So if I was going to have a, a bad pressing, I would rather have a bad 12-inch pressing than a bad 10-inch pressing. Um, and maybe eventually I'll, I'll get a um, original UK, which I hear pretty good. But um, in terms of Radiohead's career, this is probably not the most accessible place to jump straight in. I mean, this is the one you hear, this is a lot of people's favorite. Um, it's pretty, it's not like the most avant-garde thing out there. It's, if you, if you listen to a lot of experimental music and listen to this, it, you'll get it instantly, I think. It still has a lot of pop appeal. Um, most of the songwriting is still, there's still song structure, obviously, and, um, not completely insane instrumentation. It's just a lot of electronic stuff, um, a lot of cold textures. Um, they, the album art feel really um, matches the sound on here, where it kind of evokes imagery of like, are those like um, ice capped mountains, uh, mountain peaks, or maybe some kind of strange uh, icebergs or alien planet or something. It just just kind of freezing cold instrumentation electronically um, for the most part and um, kind of emotionally as well as this record is in a weird place um, it does have my favorite radio track of all time on here um, how to disappear completely which is kind of an exception to all that um, it's kind of a moment of um, uh, warmth still still kind of depression and sadness but um, in like a cathartic kind of way um, and musically, there's like barely any uh, electronic elements to it. It's acoustic guitar, bass. Um, there's a string section um, hanging out in the back for the most part, and um, and yeah, just check out that song. If you like that song, maybe listen to the rest of the album. And also the closer motion picture soundtrack. Um, if you know the the closer on the white album, uh, Good Night how he was kind of going for like a Disney, like a Walt Disney thing with like a super corny string section and, uh, and that kind of thing. That song achieves that same effect to a much, uh, much more successful um, outcome, in my opinion. So that leaves us at number 11. The last one for this part of the list is Bjork's 97 record, Homogenic, Homogenic, I've heard that pronounced both ways. Um, same kind of thing, hugely um, influential to Radiohead actually with um, Kid A. Um, electronic textures, um, you can see the kind of shimmery album cover, same kind of deal. Um, a lot of it's cold, um, almost robotic, almost like a computer wrote it. Um, she uh, I think she said something about her outfit on this cover. Um, she wanted to look like a like a warrior, but she wanted to look like a warrior um, who fights with, I think, love. As as corny as that is, um, she, uh, she's not holding any weapons or anything. I mean, she got really freakishly long fingernails. <laughs> but uh, that's just pure. Um, some of her classic tracks on here: Hunter, Yoga, um, Unravel. I think is kind of classic and all is full of love that, that closes the record um probably my favorite track on here is all neon like which is actually kind of similar to how to disappear completely from uh from kid a kind of a interesting um kind of vibe to it almost kind of creepy um a lot of these songs are kind of creepy in a lot of ways um yeah just um I think this is a very important record, my favorite Bjork record for sure, and um, uh, I feel like I have a lot more to say about this than I can kind of think of right now, but this video is going on a little bit long, so I think I'll kind of wrap it up with uh, 
that one, number 11, Majnik by Bjork. I know she's kind of divisive, but um, I'm a big fan. So yeah, that's it for this part. Um, I'll be back maybe later this weekend. Um, hopefully I'll get this uh, setup finished so I can show you guys. And then uh, next week, this time, I'll be back with uh, the big finale, the top 10 of my, uh, my top 100 series. So uh, thanks for watching, you guys. Um, I know, stick around. Um, it's, there's going to be another flow of content coming out again. Um, again, I apologize for last week where I didn't have anything, um, actually. So, uh, yeah, that's it for now. Appreciate it, you guys. See ya.